Our next speaker is Greg Barnes, who will be a very familiar face to you and across the country um, in our media, where his comment is sought on a range of matters from an Australian Republic to developments in the case of Julian Assange. Greg is a barrister and advisor to the Australian Assange campaign and has been working on the case since uh, 2012. He plays a crucial role in advocating for Julian the significance and consequence of his case and his precarious predicament. Greg ran the 1999 Republican campaign and prior to that he was a political staffer so he understands well how politicians uh, work. He's the author of four books on Australian politics. The latest is The Rise of the Right, The War on Australia's Liberal Values. And his talk is uh, titled The Threat of Extratorial Extradition. Greg Barnes. Um, thank you very much, Mary, and um, can I also acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, unceded land, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Now, uh, that's the title of my speech, but Anne has stolen most of my thunder, which is no criticism, but I'll give you about two minutes on it, then what I'll do is I'll talk to you about the politics of this case. Um, so just in relation to extraterritorial jurisdiction, the real issue is that politically uh, this is a very dangerous concept because uh, when the West lectures China and Russia uh, and various other uh, regimes around the world that don't fit within the US uh, and European orbit, uh, it generally uses the concept of the rule of law and, uh, of course, as we know, uh, Tom Bingham, the former great English judge who wrote a terrific small book called The Rule of Law in 2010, as he said, it's a phrase that's oft used by politicians, uh, but it's meaningless because uh, it's used in the context of saying what we represent is pure and what you represent is not. But there's really no difference when it comes to trying to uh, extend your domestic jurisdiction in the criminal law to persons who have no link with the jurisdiction, uh, it's no different than, in a sense, a form of kidnapping. Um, I noticed that the Wall Street Journal, each day it's published, which is six days a week, has an update in its opinion section on the journalist, uh, a journal, journalist who has been uh, in detention in uh, Russia for now well over a year, I think. And uh, I wonder why the, there hasn't been in uh, the media in this country a daily update on the case of Julian Assange. Because this is an Australian journalist, an Australian publisher, who has been subjected to the most egregious case of extraterritorial jurisdiction that most of us have seen in our lifetime. That is, as Anne said, a nation seeking to uh, extend its domestic law to an individual who embarrassed it. And this is what Bob Carr, of course, has said, and Bob has worked with John, and I acknowledge John Shipton uh, here today, who's, of course, uh, the key member, along with his son, Gabriel, in the Australian campaign, and we work with Steve Kenny from Adelaide, who's a lawyer, as a sort of core group. But, you know, um, John and I both, in our discussions with Bob Carr, uh, and I know Mary as well, uh, he's made that point. You know, why is it that the United States is concerned about this case? Because what Assange revealed were war crimes. Uh, now, the irony is, of course, that um, Nick McKenzie, who's a good friend of mine, a journalist from uh, the Nine newspapers, so I'm not the source of any of his stories, uh, he's got great sources, but, you know, Nick McKenzie and others have been lauded for their work in relation to alleged war crimes by Ben Robert Smith and others in Afghanistan, lauded for it. Um, so we laud one group of journalists while our government sits on its hands in relation to an Australian who's in the same position as Mackenzie and others, but who is languishing in Belmarsh prison, which you wouldn't wish, wish on your worst enemy. Um, and 
uh, doing, and, and I'll come to this and talk about this in a second, doing what it can, but not making this an alliance issue. So let me move on now to the political realm of this case as we currently see it. Uh, the Albanese government and Mr Albanese himself has been far more active on this case than, than his predecessors. There was hostility, you'll recall, on the part of Julia Gillard, uh, appalling hostility, including the extraordinary claim that it may have been that Assange committed offences under Australian law, which of course was put to bed by her Attorney General Robert McClelland. There was little or no movement, in fact no movement, under the success of Liberal governments. The, the one exception, of course, is Julie Bishop, with whom we had some dealings and uh, behaved in a very professional fashion in this case and in fact did raise it uh, with her counterparts uh, in the US and in the UK. So the Albanese government is elected. Uh, Albanese has said when he was in opposition that this case must end, uh, that it has to come to a conclusion and he didn't see any public interest in it continuing. He has maintained that position in government and on a number of occasions now says that he has raised the Assange case with President Biden uh, and that Penny Wong, the Foreign Minister, has raised the matter with Anthony Blinken. And most recently he has said that uh, Mark Dreyfus, the Attorney General, has raised it with Merrick Garland, uh, his counterpart in the United States. So far, of course, they've drawn a blank. Uh, they've drawn a blank uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that they have not made this an alliance issue. If you want the United States to act in a matter such as Assange, you have to make this an alliance issue. We saw this, and of course Steve Kenny was involved in this case, in the case of David Hicks. You will recall for a period of four to five years, there was pressure on the Australian government to get Hicks, who was a lost soul who ended up uh, in a training camp um, in Afghanistan, famously or infamously, with a photograph of him holding a bazooka. But that took a number of years. In fact, it was GetUp's first campaign in Australia. And what happened was that it started to hit the marginal seats. The polling, the Liberal Party's polling, was showing that it became an issue. Now, it wasn't a number one, number two, or number three issue, but it was an issue in some of these electorates, including in the electorate of Mayo in the Adelaide Hills, which then, of course, was the electorate of the Foreign Minister, Alexander Downer. Now, John Howard, who, of course, had a very, very close relationship with George Bush, you'll remember Bush called him the man of steel. He was one of the few who joined the illegal war, took Australia into the illegal war in Iraq and of course was by Bush's side in Afghanistan. But Howard moved on Hicks, not because he had em any empathy or sympathy for Hicks, but because it, it, it had become an electoral issue. But he made it an alliance issue. He called on Bush and called in the favour. And the favour, of course, was we've done everything you are, you've asked of us over the, since 9-11, everything. Uh, you need to deliver for us. Now, Australia is in the best position possible politically and diplomatically to achieve a positive outcome here. What else do we have to do? We sign up to AUKUS. Uh, we... Uh, ensure that, as Carr puts it, the greatest transfer of wealth out of the country happens. That is, we send you know, your dollars and mine over to the United States to build some submarines. We join in, as Paul Keating has said, the last link in the chain to uh, encircle China because we have a mythical you know, uh, red-baiting, uh, red terror uh, sort of view of China. I mean, no nation could do any more, and we, and, and we allow them to have troops in Darwin, as many as you want. We have Pine Gap. There is no country in the world in a strategic region that has done more for the United States than this country. New Zealand has not done it. This country has done it. I don't say that in a laudatory way. I mean, it's pathetic and craven, of course, and, and, it, and it shows that we are simply... <laughs> We are simply lackeys of an empire. 
But for God's sake, if you're in that position, call in the favour. Call in the favour. Our view, and, and I think John and Gabriel, and Gabriel, of course, has done some fantastic work in the United States, but as, as a journalist said to me recently, a former very senior journalist in this country I won't name, said to me his view was, and he's a former US correspondent, his view was that if Biden did this, if Biden said Assange can go back to Australia, it would be a ripple in the Washington Post and the New York Times and nothing more in terms of domestic pushback. That is, despite the fact that Penny Wong was humiliated last year when she stood next to Anthony Blinken in around July when Blinken was in Australia and when she was asked about Assange, she gave the standard Albanese line and Blinken went further than he needed to by saying, you need to understand, in the, in the classic sort of American lecturing style that they bring to Australia when they're addressing you know, one of the outposts of the empire, that, that, that you, know, you have to understand there are many people in the United States very, very angry about Assange. Look, that's just not the case. This case has been running for so long. There is, there is strong support in the United States, increasing support in Congress. Gabriel's been over there this week. He was, he was a guest of Thomas Massey, who's a, a leading Republican for the State of the Union address. Uh, there was a group last year of MPs, you'll remember, David Shoebridge, Peter Wish Wilson, Monique Ryan and others, uh, who went across to the United States and had very high profile meetings. The ambassador to the United States, Kevin Rudd, is very much on side. We saw the editors of US and other interna and, and international newspapers sign a letter uh, calling for Assange to be released. The opposition to Assange is reflected really in the security establishment. That is, uh, you know, the CIA, uh, the Department of Defence, etc. That's where the opposition comes from. That's Blinken's constituency, uh, but it's not a broad constituency in the United States. People, you know, people have short memories in politics, um, and the Assange case has been going so long. It is, and I don't, mean to, I don't mean to say that it's not important. It is, of course, fundamentally important, and that's why we're all here today. But it has been going on so long. I think what this journalist told me, this very senior former Australian and distinguished foreign correspondent in this country, I'll tell you right, Mary, uh, was, was, was right and is right. Uh, and he chats still to US colleagues. This can be done. There is no embarrassment. There is no great embarrassment to the United States in backing down. They did it with Hicks. Bush did it with Hicks. It can be done again. But you've got to make this, you've got to stand up to the United States sometimes. I mean, the United States likes to say, and Australia likes to say in response, we have a robust relationship and this is what, you know, politicians say, yeah, this is what good friends do. They have disagreements, you know. We agree and then we disagree. We are in a position where this alliance, um, for worse in the view of many of us, certainly in the view of Paul Keating, um, if you saw his statement this week, but, but this alliance um, has never been stronger. So this is the time. Let me, let me now deal with the domestic politics uh, of this issue. We have, um, over the past few years, and some of you may have participated in this, we have had a Meet Your MP campaign which has been highly successful. The strategy, and it's a really important strategy, and I encourage all of you, irrespective of the electorate you live in, to organise meetings, preferably in groups, with your local MP. We have, we have now, I've forgotten the number, John might be able to tell you later, but we've had well over 200, I think, John, meetings now of MPs, I must have got it wrong, he's not nodding, um, uh, you know, with MPs around Australia. And we have shifted the dial. We have shifted the dial in respect of some MPs who were neutral or taking no interest but who are now engaged in the issue and on side. And the way Canberra works is that when MPs go to caucus meetings in the case of the Labor Party, when they go to the coalition party room meeting, uh, which they hold, every, both parties hold every Tuesday in a sitting week. 
they talk about, backbenchers talk about what's, what's moving in their electorate, what's happening, what sort of emails are they getting, what sort of phone calls are they getting, uh, what sort of meetings are people wanting. And I'll bet you, I'll bet you that the Assange issue has come up. I will, I will bet you uh, at very, very short odds that in the caucus in the Labor Party and in the coalition party room, there has been discussion, I'm not saying it's, you know, like cost of living, etc., but there is discussion, and there would have been discussion from backbench MPs to ministers and shadow ministers saying, this is an issue. Suddenly we're getting these requests for meetings over the past couple of years. This has been a very successful campaign. And as I say, you know, the way backbenchers think is it's the traffic on an issue that impacts on them. That's how they operate, whether they're in a marginal seat or in a safe seat. It's the traffic. These days, emails, texts, social media, etc. That's what they're interested in. What's, what's moving people in their electorate? What's interesting people in their electorate? And that gets fed back into the party. Now, it's reflected in the fact that when we did some polling, I think last year, you know, well over 70, between 70 and 80 per cent of Australians think this case should end. Um, and many of those people would fall into this category, and I've met them. I don't really like Assange. I don't particularly like what he did, but that's not the point. Uh, it's gone on too long. It's just gone on too long. I mean, I know as a lawyer, if cases drag on, uh, people get tired of it. And people say, well, where, where's the public interest in pursuing this? Where is the public interest? Now, I've not known an extradition case, and I've done a few, to go as long as this. Most extraditions are very straightforward. A country wants your client, so long as there is an equivalent crime and so long as they're not going to be subjected to the death penalty, they're gone. They're on the plane and they're out of here. This case has gone on a long time, not because Assange has tried to block it, he's exercised fundamental legal rights, which he's entitled to do. It's gone on so long because of the sorts of issues that Anne has talked about. It is highly complex, it's highly outrageous, and it's been fundamentally opposed and it should be fundamentally opposed. But people now say to us, where is the public interest in pursuing this man? He's been in detention effectively now for 14 years. 14 years. He was in the Ecuadorian embassy from 2012 to 2019. From 2019 to now, he's been in Belmarsh prison, which is a hellish place, as I said earlier, equivalent to the, Goulburn, the notorious Goulburn Supermax in New South Wales. If he was sentenced in Australia for these alleged crimes, uh, I can tell you now, he'd be unlucky if he got 14 years. But we all know, of course, that the US sentencing regime is insane. I mean, this is the most incarcerated country in the world, and the penalties are insane. If he goes to the United States, it's not simply 170 years. It's called an effective death penalty. And if you talk to people in the anti-death penalty movement, they'll tell you that. That is an effective death penalty. So you can say to people, he would get a death penalty. He would get a death penalty because 170 years, of course, means he would, with no parole, no possibility of parole, uh, he would die in prison. So that is an effective death penalty. Lastly, um, let me now turn to the broad spectrum of support. I went into a room uh, with Gabriel, I think John was overseas earlier last year, Andrew Wilkie's support group. Um, I went into that room, one of the committee rooms at Parliament House, and I walk in and I'm sitting there with Gabriel ready to do a briefing update, and I see Adam Bant. And next to Adam Bant is Matt Canavan. <laughs> Mr Cole and Mr Green. Right? And then down, 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 the, down the table, uh, I see Barnaby Joyce. And then I see Peter Wish Wilson. You get the picture? This is a... I've not seen, I worked, in, I worked in Canberra and in state politics for 
uh, 10 years and then ran the Republic campaign, so, and I've you know, been involved in various campaigns since. I have not seen an issue, not even the Republic, sadly, um, where you get cross-party support from the hard left to the hard right and everyone in between. This is an issue which brings together coalition MPs, Teals and other independents, Greens, the National Party, uh, and I said coalition, the National Party in particular, and One Nation. Now, um, when, when this delegation went to, uh, late last year, went to Washington, which included David Shoebridge from the Greens, Monique Ryan and others, um, it got a very positive response. And one of the things that uh, was said to uh, these MPs from uh, Congress people was, thank you for briefing, on it, briefing us on it. Um, it has not come up in a lot of our meetings with Australians. Well, let me tell you, it's coming up now because it's well and truly on the radar. That was a very, very positive trip. So lastly, um, let me just say this about the campaign in Australia. This campaign in 2012-13 was a very difficult campaign. There was, the, uh, Julian Assange had, there was a 50-50 split in the community. Some people took particular views about the Swedish issues. Some people took particular views about uh, the leaking of material uh, showing war crimes, but it was very much down the middle. There has been a huge shift reflected in the political rainbow that you see in Canberra. There's been a huge shift. The number of people who say Assange shouldn't come home, you can count on one hand. That's been the big shift, and I've been in this, involved in this with John uh, since 2012. That's been the huge shift. I was talking to a journalist the other day who said to me that she'd noticed there used to be hostility among some journalists. Uh, she, she says, I don't detect that anymore. They're either very supportive or they just say, oh, well, is that case still going? Um, but there is none of the hostility that was in the media uh, back in 2012, 13. And that's the fault of the United States. Uh, it's also because of the resolution the, the, the resolute nature of the man himself and his campaign. So I'd urge you all to stay involved. We appreciate the fact that you've come here today. Uh, and um, uh, this campaign, I think, um, has never been in better shape and I think the momentum is with us. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg, for taking us through how uh, a political solution might be arrived at.